Good morning uh, and welcome uh, to the 13th meeting in 2016 of the Health and Sport Committee. Uh, I would ask everyone at, uh, uh, at this point in the room to switch off mobile phones as uh, they can sometimes interfere with the sound system and, and certainly with the proceedings here this morning. But um, you will, I would also ask you to take note that um, colleagues, uh, um, uh, um, some colleagues are using tablet devices uh, and that, that is instead of their ha hard copies of, of their papers. Um, the first item on our agenda today is stage two, day one of the Burial and Cremation Scotland Bill. Uh, as agreed uh, by the Parliament, this committee will consider amendments to those parts of the Bill which primarily relate uh, to the disposal of ashes. The meaning of cremation, as well as arrangements for adults and children, and losses during pregnancy. Amendments to the rest of the Bill will be considered by the Local Government uh, Committee at its meeting tomorrow. The amendments being considered today start at number 1000. They are not, however, 1,000 amendments, you'll be glad to hear, uh, but there, 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 are, there is a lot. <laughs> uh, the numbering uh, has been used to easily distinguish the amendments that will be considered by this committee from those uh, which will be considered by the Local Government Committee. Uh, we will be starting uh, uh, at section 36 of the Bill. Uh, can I now uh, welcome uh, Maureen Watt, Minister of Public Health, Simon Cuthbert Care, Bill Team Leader, Lindsay Anderson, Senior Principal Legal Officer, and David McLeish, Parliamentary Counsel, all from the Scottish Government. Everyone should have a copy uh, of the Bill as introduced, the mar Marshall List of the Amendments and the Grouping of Amendments. There will be one debate on each group of amendments, uh, I will call the member who lodged the first amendment in that group to speak to and move to that, uh, that, that amendment and to speak to all other amendments in the group. Members who have not lodged amendments in the group uh, but who wish to speak should indicate uh, 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 in the, in the uh, indicating their wish to speak in the normal way to me. Uh, the debate uh, on the group will be concluded by me inviting the member who moved the First Amendment in the group to wind up. Only committee members are allowed to vote. <coughs> Voting in any division is by a show of hands. Uh, can I now uh, move to the, this and call Amendment 1001 in the name of the Minister, group with Amendment 1044, uh, Minister to move Amendment 1001 and speak to both amendments in the group. Thank you, Minister. Thank you very much, Convener. Amendment 1001 provides greater clarity and certainty about what constitutes a cremation. The effect of the amendment is that cremation is the burning of human remains. Where any further processes are applied to the bones that remain, for example, if they are turned into ashes by cremulation, that is also part of the cremation. Importantly, this amendment means that where burnt bones are not reduced to ashes, this process is still regarded as a cremation. The amendment also specifies that the meaning of ashes for the bill means anything that remains after the burning process, with the exclusion of any metal that remains. <clears throat> amendment 1044 reflects this definition in the bill's interpretation section. So I move Amendment 1001. Thank, thank you. Uh, Malcolm Chisholm. Um, it's really just to um, confirm what the meaning is. I mean, in the original Act, cremation meant the reduction to ashes of human remains and the application and so on. And, and I still think there's a degree of ambiguity in the amendment that you've lodged today because it could be taken to mean the burning of human remains and includes one of, one of the following two things, or it could be, um, it could infer that it may include the burning of uh, the, the, the one of, another process. So if it's the latter, I would have thought it would be better to say insert uh, burning of human remains and may include, because I think there's an ambiguity in the way it's worded at the moment. It's not clear 
whether cremation has to include these additional processes or not, which was, of course, in, in the original bill, it had to include the additional processes. And here, I think there's an ambiguity. So I think it would be better to say, and may include, uh, and so on. I agree with what Malcolm's saying. Um, in evidence, um, we heard that some religious groups um, don't agree with cremulation, they ag agree with cremation. And I think maybe this is what the Minister was trying to deal with. Um, but I think a bit of clarity, you know, while supporting the amendment, a bit of clarity maybe at stage three, that it doesn't have to include um, if that would go against the beliefs of the family of the person who's being cremated. No other members... Minister, do you wish to respond and wind up? Um, well, uh, what I would like to say is that it was precisely because in some cases um, some religions, particularly Hinduism, don't want the cremulation process, which is why we uh, changed the wording in this amend amendment. So um, it says where a grinding process is applied. Um, so it doesn't mean that it is always applied. It just says where. That, that is likely to occur. I think that's why we used the word where in this, in this amendment. OK. Um, we, we, we now move to the question uh, that, that is uh, that amendment 1001 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is then that section 36 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. <coughs> We now move to call Amendment 1002 in the name of the Minister, grouped with Amendments 1003, 1004, 1005, 1006, 1007 and 1008. Minister, to move Amendment 1002 and speak to all amendments in the group. Minister. Thank you, Convener. Amendments 1003 to 1007 place various duties and powers on cremation authorities and funeral directors in relation to how they handle ashes. Amendment 1003 specifies that a cremation authority must, before carrying out a cremation, take reasonable steps to ascertain what an applicant would like to be done with the ashes following the cremation. The amendment provides three options – which are that the ashes will be collected by the applicant, that they will be collected by a funeral director on behalf of the applicant, or that they will be disposed of by the cremation authority on behalf of the applicant. These are options which require the cremation authority to do something with the ashes on behalf of the applicant. The applicant may choose to collect the ashes from the crematorium themselves or arrange for the funeral director to collect them. The applicant may also agree with the cremation authority that the authority will dispose of the ashes at the crematorium. Amendment 1004 places a cremation authority under a duty to follow the applicant's stated wishes about what should be done with the ashes. Amendment 1005 sets out the procedure to be followed by a cremation authority where an applicant or funeral director does not collect ashes as agreed. The Commission Authority must take reasonable steps to ascertain the wishes of the applicant again. If the applicant responds and gives further instructions, the Commission Authority will be required to comply with those wishes. If the applicant does not make known his or her wishes, the Commission Authority may dispose of the ashes in a manner prescribed by regulations. Amendment 1006 sets out the procedure to be followed by a funeral director where the funeral director has collected ashes from a crematorium on behalf of an applicant and the applicant does not in turn collect the ashes from the funeral director. In this instance, a funeral director is required to take further steps to ascertain the wishes of the applicant. If the applicant gives further instructions, the funeral director is obliged to comply with those wishes. Where the applicant does not provide any further instructions, the funeral director may return the ashes to the crematorium where the cremation was carried out. Amendment 1007 sets out the procedure to be followed by a cremation authority where a funeral director has returned ashes to the crematorium as a result of the section inserted by Amendment 1006. In this instance, the crema cremation authority 
must take reasonable steps to ascertain the wishes of the applicant about how the ashes should be handled. The applicant can either arrange to collect the ashes or ask the cremation authority to dispose of the ashes for them in, the way, in a way set out in regulations. The cremation authority must comply with any such instructions. Where the applicant does not respond or give further instructions, the cremation authority may dispose of the ashes in a manner prescribed in regulations. This group of amendments provides a clear process for how ashes are handled. At each stage, the applicant will be made aware of his or her choices and what will happen if the ashes are not collected as arranged. At each stage, the applicant is given an opportunity to specify what he or she wants to happen to the ashes. While cremation authorities and funeral directors are under duties to attempt to contact the applicant at various points, they have a power rather than a duty to dispose of ashes where the applicant does not provide further instructions. This will provide cremation authorities and funeral directors with discretion about when they choose to dispose of ashes and when they choose to retain them. Amendment 1008 gives ministers a power to make regulations about the handling of ashes. Among other matters, such as regulations, may make provision for matters such as time periods for the collections and retention of ashes and notices which must be given to applicants about these processes. And finally, the First Amendment, Amendment 1002, a very small amendment, removes subsection 1C from section 37. The effect of this is that regulations made under section 37 will not include provision about the disposal of ashes by cremation authorities. Such provision is now placed on the face of the bill and supplemented by regulations under the section inserted by Amendment 1008. So I move Amendment 1002, Convener. Thank, thank you. Nanette Millen. Question, really. Um, um, at the moment, a lot of funeral directors have left with ashes for quite a long time. Is there any time limit to be put in regulations on the, when the funeral director hands back the ashes? Um, Malcolm, we'll okay. give it, you'll have an opportunity, Minister, to, to, okay, to, 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 to respond in the winding up of the debate. And I, I just want to welcome, um, welcome the fact that uh, this amount of detail has been put on the face of the bill, whereas originally, of course, it was to be in regulation. So I know sometimes there's debates about what should be in regulation and what should be on the face of the bill, but in this case, I think it's, uh, it's, it's desirable <coughs> that it should be on the face of the bill. And the other thing I welcome is the centrality of the wishes of the applicant, which is repeated, I think, in almost all of these amendments. And I think that's... Uh, a very important principle which, which will come up later this morning as well. Any other members? Minister, to respond, wind up. Uh, yeah, well, I thank uh, Malcolm Chisholm for his comments. Uh, we did listen to all the committees um, and what they have said in their stage one reports. In terms of the length of time, there will be a limit, but that will be uh, agreed in consultation with all the, um, the bodies involved in this. Thank you, Minister. The question is then, that Amendment 1002 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. I now call Amendment uh, 1047 in the name of Malcolm Chisholm, grouped with Amendment 1048. Malcolm Chisholm to move Amendment 1047 and speak to both amendments in the group. Um, I'm sure everyone who's followed the course of the bill and indeed uh, all the events that preceded it will, will realise the centrality uh, of the issue of ashes uh, f for, um, for everyone. But it, these amendments, of course, particularly uh, refer to loss during pregnancy. And it may be that I should have specified that uh, in these uh, amendments. Um, but um, certainly that was the issue that we were um, looking at uh, in this particular committee. And the parents of, 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 who had um, endured, suffered uh, losses during pregnancy. Uh, the main issue, obviously, that came up was uh, the fact that uh, they wanted to recover uh, uh, the ashes and they wanted um, that whole process of um, uh, ashes being uh, maximised in terms of the collection uh, of uh, ashes. So the First Amendment relates to what is written on the forms. There was a lot of debates about what should be on the application forms, whether they should be a standard form or various forms.
reforms, but I think everybody who gave evidence was most concerned that the policy memorandum referred to the fact that uh, ashes might not be recovered. And I think there was unanimous agreement that there should be wording uh, to the effect that uh, it is expected that ashes will be recovered. So I just thought it was um, desirable to put that on the face of the bill, following the same principle that the Minister followed uh, in relation to the previous uh, amendments. So that was really to address a concern that was raised with us uh, on several occasions during the oral evidence. The second issue, um, in a sense, is, is related to that. Uh, how do we ensure that the, the maximum uh, amount of ashes uh, is recovered? And I, I was very struck by one of the written submissions we received. It was actually sent in anonymously, but perhaps I can uh, read uh, a little bit from that submission. The person, whether it be a man or a woman, said, we believe that standard processes and equipment, including specialist infant cremators, should be used in every crematorium to give a consistent chance of recovering ashes from each cremation in every part of Scotland. We understand that there is still no guarantee of ashes, but the knowledge that an approved approach has been applied would remove doubt and provide reassurance. So uh, the proposal here is that... Uh, there should be something in the code of practice that relates uh, to that. I believe the minister herself has um, amendments, to, in fact, to, to abolish the, the, the section of the bill that relates to code of practices, and I, I think to substitute it with codes of practices in various parts of the bill. So in, to get round that problem, uh, um, the, the amendment was couched in, in, the, in the form that it's in. So it's uh, as, as a, a new, new section, as it were, rather than as an amendment to the section that's currently there on codes of practice. So I think um, um, the parents who uh, um, gave um, evidence to us would in general uh, be supportive of uh, these two amendments, because both of them are seeking to ensure that the maximum amount of ashes uh, is recovered. Okay. Any other I member? Amendment 1047. Thank you. No other members? Dennis Roberts. Uh, very briefly, I wonder if the Minister can clarify. My understanding is that the Inspector um, of Cremations would um, carry out uh, an inquiry or investigation in in respect of uh, a case where there were no ashes recovered to actually ascertain why that was the case. Uh, and I don't know if that would help to, to answer uh, uh, the issue for Malcolm as well. So it really is just that I think in, on those rare occasions where ashes may not be recovered, uh, my understanding is that the inspector would actually uh, find out the reason for this. No other members. Minister. Thank you, uh, Convener. Amendment uh, 1047 seeks to expand the enabling power in the Bill, which will allow Ministers to make regulations about applications for cremation. We believe the Bill already provides sufficient powers which will allow Ministers to make provisions about the duties of cremation authorities, including how they are managed, operated and maintained, as well as the form um, of uh, applications for cremations. Um, so Dennis Robertson is correct um, that the inspector of uh, crematoria will be involved if uh, no ashes um, are available. Um, the, in, the policy memorandum has been superseded uh, by, new, uh, by new policy, including a code of practice issued recently, and the expect expectation is that all um, ashes will be uh, recovered. Um, I think um, in Ma what Malcolm Chisholm said, um, we now see uh, trees, baby trees, um, and a higher temperature of cremations to make sure um, that ashes are recovered. Um, amendment 1048 is unnecessary because the Scottish Ministers have already issued a code of practice dealing with this very matter, recommending methods of maximising the recovery of ashes. Um, and further, tomorrow I'll be inviting the Local Government and Regeneration Committee to agree to my Amendment 91, which would require future codes of practice for cremation authorities to be laid before and approved by the Parliament before being issued. So I would ask members to reject both amendments. Malcolm Chisholm to wind up. 
Um, well, I thank the Minister for those words. In a sense, I, I was laying the amendments in order to get these particular issues highlighted, and I think the, the fact that um, the substance of 1048 is already in the Code of Practice, according to the Minister, um, um, does, um, um, does reassure me. And in relation to the, um, um, the First Amendment 1047, um, I, I think as well, but if that is already in, in a code of practice, um, that uh, I'm reassured by that uh, as well. So that there's always a balance, obviously, between what is on the face of the bill and what is in regulations or indeed a code of practice. I, I suppose I'm not entirely clear what the status of a code of practice is in terms of... Um, uh, you know, in term, in ter what its legal status is in terms of, what, you know, what happens if somebody doesn't obey the code of practice. I suppose that's the only remaining uh, question that I have, and why, uh, you know, it, it it might be preferable to have it on the face of the bill. But uh, I'll leave it at that um, at that point as far as um, um, committee goes, and may introduce something, but probably not at stage three. Pressure withdraw. Um, the member is see seeking to withdraw uh, Amendment 1047. Uh, does any member object? No. Um, the, we, well, that is withdrawn then, and we'll move to call the next amendments, which are Amendments 1003, 1004, 1005, 1006, 1007 and 1008, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated. Um, uh, invite the Minister to move uh, amendments one, 1003 to 1008 on block. Moved on block, convener. Thank you. Uh, does any member uh, object to a single question being put uh, on amendments 1003 to 1008? Okay. No member uh, the, uh, has objected. So the question is that amendments 1003 to 1008 are agreed. Are we all agreed? Yeah. Thank you. We now call Amendment 1048 in the name of Malcolm Chisholm. Already debate. No, 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 it's not moved. That wasn't moved, was it? That wasn't moved. So we still have to call the amendment, do we? Okay. Uh, we uh, call Amendment 1048 in the name of Malcolm Chisholm, already debated with Amendment 1047. Malcolm Chisholm, to move or not move? Not move. Uh, the member is not moving. Any other member wish to move the amendment? No. No. Uh, thank you. Uh, the question is then that uh, Section 46 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. I now call Amendment 1009 in the name of the Minister, grouped with Amendments 1010, 1011, 1012, 1013, 1014, 1015, 1016, 1017, 1018, 1019, 1020, 1030, 1045 and 1046. Minister to move Amendment 1009 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Amendments 1009 to 1016 are minor amendments in nature and remove any reference to stillbirth or stillborn child from Section 47 of the Bill. This is a result of discussions with NHS colleagues and following further policy development in respect of the way in which arrangements for stillborn children are made. These amendments mean that Section 47 of the Bill now refers only to children and other amendments will introduce new sections on stillbirth. Amendments 1017 to 1020 insert new sections into the Bill to set out the procedures to be followed following a stillbirth or a post-24 week termination. Amendment 1017 uh, is about in the case of a post-24-week termination, the woman who experiences the termination 
may choose to make her own arrangements or authorise the health body to make them on her behalf. Subsection 5 of the new section allows the health body to make arrangements for the disposal of the remains. This subsection has effect where the woman informs the health authority that she does not want to make the arrangements herself, is unable to make a decision, or does not inform the health authority of uh, a decision. The effect of this subsection is to ensure that the health authority may make the arrangements for the burial or cremation of the remains, even where the woman has given no indication of her wishes. Amendment 1018 provides the process for making the arrangements for the burial of or cremation of a stillbirth. Where a stillbirth occurs, the bill provides that the nearest relative of the stillbirth has the right to instruct the disposal of the remains. The amendment sets out a list of nearest relatives for this purpose. In the first instance, the nearest relative is defined as a parent of the stillborn baby. If neither parent is able to make a decision about the disposal, the right then moves to the next nearest relative on the list, and so on until a person is able to make a decision. As well as making the arrangements themselves, the nearest relative is also able to authorise the health body to make the arrangements. The amendment requires the health body to record prescribed information in the way prescribed under this section. The amendment sets out the process by which the right to instruct the disposal will move from one nearest relative to the next, including specifying circumstances in which a nearest relative is to be discounted, for example, where he or she is under, the, under 16 years of age. The amendment also defines a health body for the purpose, purposes of this section. Amendment 1019 sets out the steps a health body must take where it is authorised to make arrangements for the burial or cremation of a stillborn child by virtue of the new section inserted by Amendment 1018. A health body may make arrangements for the remains to be buried or cremated. In the first instance, the health body must wait seven days between being authorised and making of the arrangements. This is to allow the person who authorised the health body to change their decision. However, the amendment allows the person who authorises the health body to indicate that they do not wish to wait seven days. This means that there will be no delay where burial has to take place quickly for religious or cultural reasons. Amendment 1020 provides health bodies with a general power to make arrangements for the burial or cremation of the remains of a stillborn child where it appears that no other arrangements are being made. Other amendments provide a process for making such arrangements, but in cases where, for whatever arrangement, for, for whatever reason, no arrangements are made, this amendment allows a health body to make those arrangements. Amendment 1030 and 1046 reorganise the definitions of health authority, health board, and independent health care service by rem removing them from section 50 of the bill and putting definitions for those last two expressions into section 75, the Bill's General Interpretation section. The definition of health authority is no longer needed. Amendment 1045 changes the me meaning of foetus to include embryo. This will ensure that provisions relating to pregnancy loss includes those at the embryonic stage. I move Amendment 1009. Thank you, <coughs> Minister. Um, um, no, no, no member wishing to enter that debate. Um, Minister doesn't want to add anything. And the question is then, Amendment 1009 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Uh, I now call Amendments 1010, 1011, 1012, 1013, 1014, 1015, 1016, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated. Um, I invite the Minister to move Amendments 1010 to 1016 on block. Done block. Thank you. Um, does any member uh, object to a single question be put on amendments 1010 to 1016? No. Uh, no member has objected. The question is then that amendments 1010 to 1016 
are, are, are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes, Thank you. Um, the, the, the question is then that section 47 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. I now call amendments uh, 1017, 1018, 1019 and 1020. All in the name of the Minister and all previously debated. Uh, I invite the Minister to move amendments 1017 to 1020 on block. Moved on block, Nina. Thank you. Um, uh, does any member uh, object to a single question being put on amendments uh, 1017 to 1020? No member has objected. The question is then that amendments 1017 to 1020 are agreed. Are we all agreed? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. <coughs> uh, I now call amendment 1021 in the name of the Minister, group with amendments 1022. 1023, 1024, 1025 and 1026. Um, a minister to move amendment 1021 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Convener. The overall effect of amendments 1022 to 1024 is to amend section 48 so as to require a person who is making a decision about the disposal of the remains of a deceased person to have regard, so far as is known to the person, to de the deceased's religion or beliefs when choosing burial or cremation. Section 48 already requires the person to have regard to any wishes about the method of disposal expressed by the deceased, as far as they are known to the person. Amendments 1021 and 1025 make minor drafting adjustments of sections 48.1 and 49.1b of the Bill. Amendment 1026 removes references to making applications to, to a Sheriff. These are no longer relevant because of changes to the process brought about by the Court Reform Scotland Act 2014 by summary application. So I move Amendment 1021. Okay. Uh, I have no members wishing to participate at this point. Minister, nothing further to add. Thank you. The question is then, uh, Amendment 1021 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. I now call Amendments uh, 1022, 1023, 1024, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated. Uh, I invite the Minister to move Amendments 1022 to 1024. Four in block. Moved on block. Thank you. Uh, um, it, does any member object to a single question being put on amendments 1022 to 1024? No, no objection. The question is then that uh, amendments 1022 to 1024 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you very much. Uh, the question now is that uh, section 48 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Um, I call amendment uh, 1025 in the name of the Minister, already debated with amendment 1021. Uh, Minister, to move formally. Moved formally. Thank you. Um, the question is then that amendment 1025 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. I now call Amendment 1026. In the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 1021. Uh, Minister, to move formally. Moved. Thank you. The question is then that Amendment 1026 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thanks very much. The question is that Section 49 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I now call Amendment 1027 in the name of the Minister, group with Amendments 1028, 1029, 1031, 1032, 1033, 1034, 1035, 1036, 1049, 1037, 1050, 1038, 
1039, 1040, 1041, 1042, and 1043. Um, can I point out at, uh, at this point if, that if Amendment 1036 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendment 1049, as it, it will be preempted. Uh, Minister to move Amendment 1027 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. The overall effect of this group of amendments is to strengthen the process a health authority must follow when a woman experiences a pregnancy loss of 24 weeks gestation or less. Amendment 1027 adjusts the drafting of the bill to make clear that this section applies in the case of pregnancy losses occurring up to and including 24 weeks gestation. Amendment 1028 ensures that where a woman who experiences a pregnancy loss authorises another person to make arrangements for the disposal of the remains in a particular way, that person must make the arrangements in the way specified by the woman. Amendment 1029 ensures that as soon as a woman makes a decision about what she would like to be done with the remains of a pregnancy loss, a health authority must record that decision and take reasonable steps to secure the woman's signature in relation to the decision. Amendment 1031 relates to situations where a woman changes a decision that she has made under Section 50. The effect of this amendment is to provide legal certainty that the new decision the woman makes is to be treated as though it were a decision made under Section 50. Amendment 1032 addresses a potential gap where a woman authorises a person to make the arrangements for the disposal of remains and that person then asks a health authority to make the arrangements. The effect of this amendment is to require the person to specify that the health authority must make the arrangements in the way specified originally by the woman. This will ensure that the woman's wishes are carried out. Amendment 133 ensures that where a woman chooses to make her own arrangements for the burial or cremation of the remains of a pregnancy loss, the health authority will give her the remains. Similarly, similarly where a person authorised by the woman to make the arrangements wishes to make his or her own arrangements, the amendment ensures that the health authority will give them the remains. Amendment 1034 makes a drafting change to provide clarity about the process that a health authority will carry out, replacing a reference to disposing of remains with a reference to making arrangements for their disposal. This adjustment better reflects the actual process, where the health authority will make arrangements for disposal, but not actually carry out the disposal itself. Amendment 1035 allows a person who authorises a health authority to make arrangements for disposal to specify that they do not wish the seven-day waiting a period to apply before arrangements are made. This will allow the remains to be buried or cremated as soon as possible and ensure no unnecessary delays where burial is required to take place quickly for religious or cultural reasons. The amendment will not require a person to indicate why they do not wish the seven-day period to apply. Amendment 1036 allows a health authority to take various steps when no arrangements have been made at the end of the six-week period from the date of a pregnancy loss. Subsection 2 places the health authority under a duty to consider whether it would be in the woman's best interest to contact her to try to ascertain what she wants to happen to the ashes. The amendment is structured in this way to reflect the wide variety of circumstances which might have led to this point. For example, a woman may not yet have been able to reach a decision about what she would like to happen to the remains. In this instance, the Health Care Authority may continue to support the woman to make a decision. The amendment does not place a time scale on this outcome. In other circumstances, however, a woman may have given no notice of what she would like to happen to the remains and have had no contact with the health authority since the loss occurred. In this instance, the health authority may conclude 
that the woman has indicated that she does not want to be involved in the process and may therefore choose to make arrangements for the disposal of the remains. Sections 2E and 2F provide the Health Authority with the power to make arrangements for the disposal of remains where no decision has otherwise been made. This amendment places considerable emphasis on the Health Authority's judgment of a particular situation. In particular, where the Health Authority has an ongoing relationship with the woman and knows that she is trying, still trying to reach a decision about what sh should be done with the remains. The Health Authority is under no obligation to make arrangements for the disposal of the remains. The Health Authority will have been involved since the loss occurred and it is appropriate that it is given flexibility to act according to a variety of situations that might occur and require different responses so that the best outcome is achieved in each instance. Such decisions will be based largely on the Health Authority's relationship with the woman. The Scottish Government will provide guidance to Health Authorities to support the operation of this process. Amendment 1049 in the name of Malcolm Chisholm seeks to allow a health authority to make contact with a woman who has experienced a pregnancy loss about arrangements for the disposal, where arrangements have not been made within the initial six-week period. It would require a health authority to seek a woman's views about disposal and to give her more time to make the decision about arrangements for disposal should she request it. I accept the principle behind this amendment, which is why I brought forward my amendment 1036. This is built round a woman's best interests, which will ensure that health authorities have to seek a woman's views where arrangements for disposal have not been made after pregnancy loss and to give her time to come to a decision about this. As a result, amendment, I don't think amendment 1049 is necessary and I invite the member not to move the amendment. Amendment 1037 allows a health authority to discuss options with a woman where it is known that a pregnancy loss will occur but has not yet happened. It can be, be beneficial for the woman to consider what she would like to happen to the remains before the loss occurs. This amendment allows a health authority to discuss these matters before a pregnancy loss occurs but does not require that it does so if it does not believe that it would be in the woman's best interests to do so. Amendment 1050, again in the name of Malcolm Chisholm, requires that registers kept by health authorities in relation to pregnancy lost must be kept electronically. I fully accept the principle behind this amendment. I have brought forward Amendment 128, which will be considered by the Local Government and Regeneration Committee tomorrow. This will have the same effect as Amendment 1050, but will also go wider by requiring that all information be kept, to be kept under the Bill must be stored in electronic form. Amendment 1050 is therefore, I don't think, necessary, and I invite the Member again not to move the amendment. Amendments 1039 and 1041 remove the power to create offences from the regulation making power in section 55. Amendment 1043 sets out offences in relation to registers kept by health authorities in relation to pregnancy loss on the face of the bill by inserting a new section after section 55. <coughs> Amendment 1040 inserts a new provision to require health authorities to keep registers about pregnancy losses indefinitely. This is consistent with the approach taken to other registers made under the Bill. Amendment 1042 provides a definition of health authority for the purposes of this section. Amendment 1038 inserts the word or between subsections 2A and B. This is a drafting adjustment and provides drafting consistency with other parts of the Bill. Convener, I move Amendment 1027. Thank you, Minister. Malcolm Chisholm to speak to Amendment 1049 and, and other amendments in the group. Um, thank you, um, Convener. Um, can I just deal with 1050 first, because I think that's been uh, dealt with by the Minister in terms of her own amendment being lodged. Uh, tomorrow. So assuming that that is going to be passed, then I'd certainly have no need to move 
Amendment 1050. I'm, I'm not so sure about 1049. My starting place for this was a paragraph in the Minister's speech in the Stage 1 debate, which I'm sure she won't mind me reading out. In setting out what will happen after a pregnancy loss, the bill ensures that the woman who has experienced the loss is at the centre of the decision-making process. So that's the first principle. That's my, my words there. I intend to lodge a Stage 2 amendment to further support an even more person-centred approach to deciding what should be done with the remains of a pregnancy loss. That will ensure that no woman is ever rushed into making a decision and will provide extra flexibility where a woman needs more time to decide what she wants to happen. So uh, the more time issue for me is the second principle. Now, I heard what the Minister said, but I was actually struggling when I read her Amendment 1036 to find any uh, specific reference to a, a woman expressing the need for more time. So I, I remain to be persuaded uh, about that. In my particular uh, amendment, I made it quite clear that if the woman informs the appropriate health authority that she requires a further period to make a decision, the authority must take such steps as it considers necessary to accommodate that request. So I, I don't actually see that dealt with in the Minister's uh, amendment, because I think the principle here, and quite rightly, uh, the Minister lodged 1035 to ensure that um, everything could be finalised in less than seven days, if that's what the woman definitely wanted, um, and I welcome that amendment. Uh, the other side of the coin is, of course, that it should be longer than the six-week period if the woman wants more time. So that was the first point. The second point is that I did have some concerns <coughs> about um, the words about the best interests of the woman. Obviously, we all want to act in the best interests of the woman, but who, has, who is to decide that? And I think um, um, people always get a bit suspicious uh, when, when, when people are seen to be acting on behalf of others without actually asking them. This came up in a different context in the bill last week in terms of the duty of candour and making sure that people are always asked rather than assumptions made in a paternalistic fashion. So I'm just a bit suspicious of the wording about, well, we'll contact the woman if we think it's in her interest to be contacted. And I think it's a bit more straightforward to actually say the woman will be contacted. And then what follows is either, um, well, one of three things, either uh, arrangement for the disposal of the remains uh, in accordance with her wishes or um, if, if she doesn't express a wish then uh, to, to have an influence on that, then um, it can be done um, without regard to, um, to her position since she doesn't have one. And thirdly, of course, uh, she's asking for more time. So I think my amendment does deal with those fundamental uh, principles of uh, the centrality of the woman's view and also explicitly allowing for a longer period of time if that's what the woman wants. So um, I remain to be... Um, convinced that all of that is dealt with in Amendment 1036. So I'll move uh, 104 now. Any other amendment? In the name, Millen, and then Bob Doris. Um, just to say, I, when I came to this meeting, I couldn't really distinguish between the two amendments very, very clearly. But having listened to what's been said by the Minister and by Malcolm Chisholm, I, I do think that Malcolm Chisholm's amendment is Really, really more explicit and make sure that the woman is contacted. And I think I'd rather uh, support Malcolm Chisholm's amendment. Thank you. Bob Doris. Um, thanks, I, I wasn't going to make a contribution about whether uh, the Minister's amendment or Mr Chisholm's was, was preferable. I suppose my take on that would be I would support the government amendment and there's still a stage three process if there's great clarity to be needed. So I would, I would support the government amendment at this stage. But the substantive contribution, but but a brief one I wanted to make was in relation to Amendment 1, 137, um, which refers to uh, where a, a pregnancy is expected to be unsuccessful in, in the early stages and having a conversation with, with, with the parents about the, uh, how they would like their, their unborn child to be disposed with. I, I think through constituency casework I've had and, 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 and experience that I've had with uh, family and friends, that's a significant step forward in how we deal sensitively with the uh, early pregnancy loss, and I very much uh, welcome that. I, I think I, I would also um, put on record that uh, it, it's a tough shift um, being NHS frontline staff, but there's always a need to reinforce the sensitivity that's needed 
um, when there is a, a, a pregnancy which is deemed to be failing and, and uh, people go to accident emergency or wherever they go with a, a frontline NHS staff and it's not always early pregnancy clinics and it's not always maternity services and just the need that when we pass this legislation to make sure we've also got the awareness raising level with NHS frontline staff for how they should deal uh, with that situation as well. But I think that's a significant step forward, what we have from the Scottish Government here today, dealing particularly sensitively with, with, with uh, these situations. And I call the Minister to wind up. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, I think we just need to remember that this section applies uh, in relation to a woman where the, um, and the relevant experience, uh, uh, the relevant period um, has expired. I mean, I, and throughout this amendment, I notice that, you know, I, it's always saying the best interests of women, the best interests of them, the best interest of, of the woman. And it's based on the authorities' relationship, I think, uh, with the woman and uh, where the woman is still involved in the process. It is based on uh, her view entirely. But the woman may have indicated that she doesn't want to be involved or has not given a view, and it may um, be in the best interests of the woman. Um, you know, it might be too painful that she's contacted again, and I think this amendment reflects this. Okay. the The question is then that amendment uh, one thousand and twenty-seven be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Uh, now call amendments one thousand and twenty-eight, one thousand and twenty-nine, and one thirty. 1030, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated. Uh, I invite the Minister to move amendments 1028 to 1030 on block. Moved on block. Um, does any uh, member uh, object to a single question be put on the amendments 1028 to 1030? No. no. Uh, no member has objected. The question is that, uh, that amendments 1028 to 1030 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, the question now is then that uh, section 50 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I now call amendment 1031 in the name of the Minister. Already debated with amendment 1027. Minister, to move formally. Moved. Thank you. The question is then that Amendment 1031 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The yes. question is then that uh, Section 51 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thanks. Uh, I now call Amendment 1032 in the name of the Minister, already debated with uh, Amendment 1027. Minister, to move formally. Moved. Thank you. The question is then that Amendment 1032 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. The question is then that Section 52 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, I now call Amendment 1033 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 1027. Minister, to move formally. Moved. Thank you. The question is then that Amendment 1033 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thanks. I now call Amendment 1034. In the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 1027. Minister, to move formally. Moved. Thank you. The question is then that Amendment 1034 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Uh, I now call Amendment 1035 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 1027. Minister, to move formally. Moved. Thank you. The question is then that Amendment 1035 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question now is that uh, qu uh, the Section 53 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. I now call Amendment 1036 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 1027. Can I remind members that if Amendment 1036 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendment 1049. Uh, Minister, to move formally. Moved formally. Uh, the question is then, Amendment 1036 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. No. 
the committee has not agreed. Um, so we need to the move to a uh, division. Uh, and can I have a show of hands, please, uh, that, uh, for those in favour of Amendment 1036? Those, those against? Those for, for the amendment five, those against the amendments four, there were no abstentions. Uh, the, 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 the amendment is, is, is therefore agreed to. We now move to, uh, where are we, the question... Now is that section 54 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. I call amendment 1037 in the name of the minister already debated with 1027. Minister to move formally. Move formally. Thank you. The question is then that amendment 1037 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I now call Amendment 1050 in the name of Malcolm Chisholm, already debated with Amendment 1027. Uh, Malcolm Chisholm to move or not move? Not moved. Uh, the member is not moving the amendment. Uh, is there any other member who wishes to move the amendment? No. no? Okay, thank you. Uh, we, now, we now move to call amendments... Um, 1,038, 1,039, 1,040, 1,041 and 1,042, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated. I invite the Minister to move amendments 1,038 to 1,042 on block. Moved on block. Thank you. Um, does any member object to a single question being put on amendments 1,038 to 1,042? There is no objection. The question, therefore, is that amendments 1038 to 1042 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. The question now is that section 55 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah. Thank you. We now call amendment uh, 1043 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 1027. Minister, to move formally. Formally moved. Can Thank we? you very much. The question is that Amendment 1040 be agreed, 43 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I now call Amendment 1044 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 1001. The Minister, to move formally. Formally moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 1044 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I now call Amendment 1045. In the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 1009. Minister, to move formally. Formally moved. Thank you. The question is then that Amendment 1045 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I now call Amendment 1046. In the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 1009. Minister, to move formally. Formally moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 1046 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes, yes. Thanks. That ends consideration of amendments at Stage 2 of the Bill by the Health and Sport Committee. Uh, members should note that the bill will not at this stage be reprinted and an electronic version of the bill will be uh, produced this afternoon, which will show the amendments that have been agreed by the Health and Sport Committee. Thank you very much. We now suspend at this point and uh, before we move to the next item on our agenda. Thank you very much.
We now move to. Um, oh, we've not got all our witnesses yet. We're waiting.
uh, with your agreement, I'll, I'll uh, temporarily, you know, come off the, the agenda. We'll go back on the uh, agenda item number two when uh, we 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 find our, our witnesses. But uh, agenda item number three uh, is is subordinate legislation, and we have five negative uh, instruments to dispose of today. Uh, the first instrument is the National Assistance Assessment of Resources Amendment Scotland number two regulations 2016 SSI 2016-80. There has been no motion uh, to annul the delegate by, uh, and the delegated powers and law reform committee has not made any comments on the instrument. Uh, do, do members here have any comments? The, there is no comments from committee members. It is agreed then that we would make no recommendation. Uh, thank you for that. The second instrument is the National System Assistance Sums for Personal Requirements, Scotland, number two, Regulations 2016, SSI 2016, backslash 87. There has been no motion to annul, and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee have not made any comments on the instrument. Uh, do any members here wish to make comment? There is no comment uh, from committee members. Um, uh, uh, can I therefore uh, take it that we are agreed to make no recommendations? Agreed. No, that, thank you. The third instrument uh, is country of origin of certain meat Scotland regulations 2016, SSI 2016-84. There has been no motion to annul. However, the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee did provide some comments on this instrument and the DP. LRC drew the attention of the Parliament uh, on these regulations to the general reporting ground that some of the terms defined in the instrument are superfluous as they do not use they are not used else, elsewhere within the instrument and should ha have therefore been omitted. Uh, it is to be said that the Scottish Government has advised that whilst these words have no effect, they will be removed at the next convenient legislative opportunity. Uh, do uh, any members wish to comment on this? No, no comment. Uh, is the committee therefore agreed to make no recommendation? Thank you. That is agreed. The fourth instrument is the National Health Service Pension Scheme Scotland Amendment Regulations 2016 SSI 2016-97. Uh, I see some people in the public gallery bristling there when they sat up straight at that point when the pension scheme was mentioned, but uh, I better push you on to the formalities here. There, 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 has, been, there, there, has, um, there has been no motion to annul and the Delegated Power and Law Reform Committee has not made any comments on the instrument. Uh, can I, is there any, any comment from members? No. no? Uh, is the committee agreed to make no recommendations? Right, thank you. That is agreed. And the fifth and final instrument before us today is the National Health Service Superannuation Scheme Miscellaneous Amendments Scotland Regulations 2016 SSI 2016-98. There, uh, there has been no motion to annul and the Delegated Power and Law Reform Committee has not made any comments on the instrument. Um, do committee members wish to make comments? No. Is the committee agreed then to make no recommendations? Agreed. That is agreed. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that. Make some progress. We, we, we can now, uh, I, I think, um, get ourselves to agenda item number two, which is oral evidence on one uh, uh, negative instrument. Uh, Healthcare Improvement Scotland Delegation of Functions Order 2016 SSI 86. This is an instrument that looks to give Healthcare Improvement Scotland the power to direct health boards to close hospital wards to new admissions where it believes that there is a serious risk to life, health or well-being. Can I welcome again this morning uh, Maureen Watt, Minister for Public Health. Elizabeth Sadler, Head of Planning and Quality Division, Scottish Government. Ilsa Garland, um, uh, Principal Legal Officer, Scottish Government. And Robbie Pearson, Interim Chief Executive uh, uh, of, of, uh, of uh, Health Improvement Scotland. And Jackie McRae, Head of Quality of Care, Healthcare 
Improvement Scotland. Welcome to you all. Um, I, I invite the Minister to make a short opening statement uh, and, and, and thereafter move to questions. Minister. Uh, thank you, Convener, and thank you for providing me with the opportunity to explain the rationale behind the Healthcare Improvement Scotland Delegation of Functions Order 2016. Tackling and reducing healthcare associated infection and containing antimicrobial resistance remains a key priority for Ministers and the Scottish Government. Since 2007, latest figures show that cases of C. difficile in patients aged 65 years and over have reduced by 84% and cases of MRSA have reduced by 88%. Although this demonstrates significant progress, the challenge is to look at ways to continue this reduction to drive down HAI rates. Incidence of key HAIs has seen a plateauing over the past two years. We need to work even harder to ensure these figures move in the right direction as we continually strive to ensure appropriate, appropriate and updated advice is accessible to all those dealing with infection, with infection prevention and control. This Government will continue this work to drive forward improvements across NHS Scotland as we work closely with Healthcare Improvement Scotland, Health Protection Scotland and the Scottish Antimicrobial and Healthcare Associated Infections Strategy Group to reduce further infection rates. We will also support health boards to deliver further improvements for the safety of healthcare staff, patients and the public. In relation to the specific measures contained within this SSI, the Scottish Government fully accepted all the recommendations made in the report of the Vale of Leaven Hospital inquiry. Recommendation 1 in Lord Maclean's report was that the Scottish Government should ensure that the Healthcare Environment Inspectorate, HEI, which is part of Healthcare Improvement Scotland, has the power to close a ward to new admissions if the HEI concludes that there is a real risk to the safety of patients. In the event of such closure, an urgent action plan should be devised with the infection prevention and control team and management. This SSI implements that recommendation by giving his the powers to give directions to boards to close a hospital ward to new admissions, where his considers that without the direction to close, there would be a serious risk to life, health or well-being. These powers will not be limited to reasons of cleanliness and would be applicable if other safety reasons, such as staffing levels and other non-medical non reasons. They are designed to ensure patient safety, and it is therefore right that these powers cover, cover all circumstances where there is a serious risk to life, health and well-being. His has, in conjunction with the Scottish Government and other interested stakeholders, developed an escalation procedure which includes arrangements regarding powers to direct closure of wards to new admissions. The draft procedure was shared with health boards on 3 March for their views, and I have asked that a copy of the final paper be sent to the Committee for your information. I should stress that closing a ward to new admissions is intended as an option of last resort and one which we hope is never needed. I would assure the Committee that his will work with NHS Board, particularly Chief Executives and Medical Directors, to address any concerns raised as a result of an inspection of any hospital. My officials have confirmed that the escalation procedure will provide a clear, transparent and consistent process to manage the identification and escalation of serious issues facing NHS service delivery, quality and safety of care and organisational effectiveness. The escalation process will ensure clear communication paths across all stakeholders, clarity of roles and responsibilities, and an explicit record of actions undertaken in partnership with boards to secure a timely resolution and consistent and effective communication between his and board officials will be crucial to achieving this resolution. <coughs> in summing up, convener, this SSI meets our commitment to implement Recommendation 1 of the Vale of Reven report. It gives his the power to give directions to boards to close a hospital ward to new admissions, where his considers there is a serious glyph, uh, risk to life, health or well-being. The draft escalation process published by his makes clear this power would only be used very rarely and as a measure of last resort. It is, however, an important additional to tool to safeguard patient safety. 
and I'm happy to answer any questions, convener, if any members do Thank have you, any. Um, um, Minister. Rhoda Grant's our first question this morning. The Minister has said that she doesn't believe the power will be used very often. So I want to ask what kind of circumstances she would see that happening and what would be the process, because we know that health boards can close wards to new admissions at the moment. What would be the process if his word was doing that rather than the health board? Um, well, it, it would only uh, be in a very unusual situation. Um, there are powers for uh, in the NHS... Uh, Service Scotland uh, 74 Act for ministers to take actions where uh, certain bodies, including health boards, aren't well are failing to carry out uh, their functions. Um, so we we don't envisage a situation where these uh, powers would be used, um, given the close understanding and cooperation that there is currently between uh, ministers and boards. Um, but it would be in a very un unusual situation. But I don't know if anyone wants to add anything. Mr. Pierce, um, in terms of healthcare improvement, Scotland's role in this, um, we're quite clear this sits within a broader escalation framework. And that framework at the moment is already in place ahead of those powers and is used in our inspections when we uh, meet a concern on the ground and maybe about or staffing levels, it may be about infection control. And the key part of the existing escalation process we have is about local resolution of those concerns. And in the vast majority of instances, in my personal experience, having been Director of Scrutiny and Assurance for four years, as these issues are addressed and resolved at the local level um, with the intervention of our inspectors working closely with the staff on the ground. In instances whereby these powers would be applied, it would be, as the Minister described, a last resort, and it would be in the instance of escalation to the Chief Executive of Healthcare Improvement Scotland and in discussion with the Chief Executive and the accountable, as the accountable officer for that health board about the concerns and seeking that Chief Executive of that health board, that health organisation, to take steps to prevent admissions into that ward environment. If the Chief Executive of Healthcare Improvement Scotland and that Chief Executive failed to reach agreement that that was the most appropriate action, the action and steps in these powers would be for Healthcare Improvement Scotland to instruct that health board to stop all new admissions into a ward. So it's important um, for, for the committee, uh, convener, if I may so that, say so, this escalation algorithm is at the very pinnacle of an escalation process and uh, needs to be seen within that context. Um, can, I, can I ask, obviously this is about closing the ward to new admissions, and if it's for infection control purposes that makes sense because you would be isolating those who may already have been in, um, infected as well and not moving them to the hospital. But if it's about patient safety and say staffing numbers, then surely the patients that are left in the ward um, are still in danger and what steps would you be taking to deal with the dangers if it wasn't infection control which is more easily understandable can, can, can yes, answer that yes, um, in terms of if it was what staffing levels then clearly a reduction in the number of admissions going into that ward would be beneficial in terms of the actual cohort of available staff to actually manage a much reduced number of patients within that ward environment so that would be uh, an immediate action and I think the important point to make clear to the committee as well is that boards already take action at present when there are concerns about, um, uh, for instance, staffing levels or infection control and do make, uh, take actions, for instance, in a norovirus outbreak to prevent admissions into a ward environment if there was concerns about patient safety and about uh, life and well-being of individual patients on that ward. So that would be an important step in the context of staffing levels, but there's a range of uh, scenarios which the committee would obviously be aware of in which these steps may have to be taken. Well, Mr Pearson, would you, you know, we, we're not necessarily aware of the range of uh, uh, areas that would fall into serious risk to life, health or well-being. We've established that a couple where there is, there is already remedies in place in terms of, of infection. Uh, we've heard that, that it, might include, it might and could include uh, staffing levels or staffing mix. 
So what 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 it, what other scenarios or uh, uh, would you place in that general area of of uh, the use of these powers? It could, for example, uh, be in a theatre where somebody notices that the cleanliness isn't up to standard. So it could be in that situation. Right. I don't know if you want to add any others. So oh. theatre situation, staffing levels mix. Uh, well, in, in, in terms of uh, um, other examples, Jackie McKay may wish to add, but an example may be um, in, in the context of extreme pressure at the front of a hospital in terms of the numbers of A&E attendances and patients required to be seen within an assessment unit. That may then have an impact in terms of um, safety and demand within that hospital environment, but the overall hospital and how patients are managed within the flow of that Hospital. So that would be another example, but uh, Jackie McCray wished to add a few other instances. So that, that would be the other example I would think of, but again, I suppose it's to reiterate that um, boards would generally, in our experience, take immediate action to resolve these issues, taken into the context the safety of patients in the whole system rather than just at that individual point of uh, concern. But it's, it's just about what it gives you. You know, I mean, I can see it, an infection. I can see it, uh, an accident in the emergency. There's been a, an accident, and, and, and there's been a major accident. Emergency planning comes into place. People are sent to other, to, to other hospitals within an immediate area. I can see that. That happens. Infection. We know that happens. We read about it. We hear about it. Um, so... What does this give us in terms of powers for yourselves that we don't already have? And 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 what would your role be in it? When, when do you decide? When would it be your decision? Who would decide that the health board has failed to act in the interest of of, of risk or life or health and well-being to, towards the I mean, I, I can't see... I'm having difficulty uh, about seeing where this would be relevant and what additional powers this actually gives us that we've not already got. Well, I think it was because Lord McLean, in his report, specifically asked um, that this be one of this was one of his recommendations um, that the Scottish government uh, ensure that healthcare improvement um, uh, Scotland had the power. Uh, and it wasn't just left um, to health boards because I think in his inquiry he felt um, that there was perhaps a gap there. Um, so it specifically comes from Lord McLean's uh, recommendations on the Vale of Leaving inquiry. So there's a wider point about what, whether Health Improvement Scotland is a regulator or part of the health service. Is that what he was getting at? It's a, it's a computer, the, the broader recommendation and the broader consideration of Lord McLean's inquiry was that he did not feel, um, as chair of that inquiry, that there, were, there was a need for um, additional powers beyond those within that first recommendation. And also, in terms of the, the inquiry report, made clear that there was sufficient independence and separation at present in terms of the role of healthcare improvement Scotland. Hmm. Got supplementaries, I think. Yeah, one more from Rhoda, and then yeah. I've got a supplementary on this theme. Are you on this theme? Indeed, next right, next theme, and I'll get you. And I've got Dennis who wished to get in. So, Rhoda, uh, supplementary uh, yeah. from Mike and Dennis, and then Bob. I'm, I'm not. Um totally satisfied with the answer to my previous question about if it were down to uh, patient numbers and staffing numbers and that being seen as unsafe. Yes, closing the ward to new admissions would mean that that pressure didn't escalate, but it doesn't do anything to remove that, that safety pressure. Um, and one would assume that unless you suddenly start discharging patients, but there, there is no... There is no um, you can't assume that patients are going to be discharged because you don't know the nature of the ward. They could be long term. Um, how would you deal with that safety risk for existing patients in the ward? Well, I think 
um, you know, hospitals already deal with that. If there is an example, uh, as we stated, an outbreak of, of norovirus, for example, it can not only affect patients, but it can affect staff as well. And that's why a ward would be closed to new admissions and staff would be moved from other parts of the hospital um, to make sure that those patients who were already in that ward, uh, who are not fit to be discharged, are still looked after. In, in the instrument are, are there to ensure that staffing levels would be increased to deal with the patient safety concern rather than just stopping admissions? Well, it would be something that would be discussed with all the, the partners involved uh, because, as we've already said, it, it's, it, wouldn't be taken by, uh, one, it wouldn't be taken by his alone. It would be taken uh, by his in conjunction uh, with the health board, with the senior management, management and, indeed, if necessary, min, uh, government ministers. If I wonder if I could just interject. Yeah. Um, the, the order itself is very much restricted to simply giving the power to his to give the direction to close the ward. But my understanding, I don't know if others want to come in, is that the whole kind of escalation procedure involves discussing measures to help improve the situation in hand. And so that would be part of that kind of wider procedure is what to do about this situation that has led to this direction to close a ward. Mr Pearson, does this, this regulation give you greater power in your relationship with health boards to get quicker action uh, or, or, or uh, in that discussion or negotiation? Does it, does it help? Yeah, yes, it, it, it does convene. I mean, obviously, having that power um, does allow us um, um, a degree of um, direction and um, formality and, and legal power that we do not have at present. I think the important point as well, if, if I may pick up, it does not take away and disturb the accountability that exists for chief executives of health boards to deliver safe services to their respective populations so they still remain accountable for the safety and well-being of patients that, that are within their care and obviously the mix of services in which you provide them, which includes the, the workforce and staffing levels, for instance. Mike, Mike uh, McKenzie, a supplementary on this? Yes, uh, thank you. And, uh, uh, Mr Pearson, it's a question for Mr Pearson. You mentioned that an algorithm would be used in the decision-making process, and that thought fills me with concern. Um, will the decision be made by a <coughs> human being, or will it be made by a computer? I'm sure you could understand the public concern if it's a question of the computer says no. I'm interested to find out a wee bit more about this algorithm. I wonder if you could share that information perhaps in writing with the committee. And will this algorithm take into account geographical circumstances and capacity situations that you may find in places like Orkney, Shetland or the Western Isles? And will it take into account the prevalent weather conditions that may mean that it's impossible to evacuate patients to your alternative facilities in the mainland? Yes, please. Okay, uh, thank you, Convener. Um, in terms of the, the algorithm, can I assure the committee this is not um, some remote computer-generated um, yes-no answer. This will be informed by clinical and professional judgment on the ground. The senior inspector, inspectors working with staff in delivering those services. So it's about professional judgment and about the management and appropriate management of risk. So just to emphasise that point, the algorithm can only guide. It's not a, a, a fixed thing. It guides and obviously influences the number of steps within it. But within each step, there's a professional judgment to be made about risk and about the impact on the quality of care for patients. As regards the operating context, I think what's the general point about remote areas and rurality is that that would be part of the risk assessment in, in assessing the situation on the ground. And obviously it varies vastly across Scotland, the delivery and pattern of health services. And um, a key thing to take into account is that operating context and understanding the distribution and mix of services. So for instance, there may be a different response in these situations when you're dealing with um, a, a, an environment, a hospital environment that has a large number of single rooms versus an open plan ward environment. And again, that would be quite different again, how you might respond in these situations. Okay. Dennis Roberts. Uh, thank you, Kavira. Uh, Mr. Pearson, you just sort of, uh, sort of preempted. Um, but it's just clarity uh, with regard to single rooms. A ward may comprise of a number of single rooms, so therefore you may not wish to close the ward but isolate individual rooms. Um, 
and I'm just wondering if you know you can give sort of greater clarity on that. Yes, I think that's an important point. That um, in terms of um, new hospitals such as the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, which is uh, single rooms, um, then is, is a different response for other environments in which you may be a more traditional open plan Nightingale Ward environment. And I think again it comes down to a careful assessment of risk um, for individual patients and how that is mitigated on the day and to ensure as quickly as possible that new admissions are readmitted to the ward. But convener uh, Jackie McCree wished to may add more detail in that respect. Yes, so I suppose it is very much about the individual context and I suppose just to bear in mind the timescales around which some of these things might happen and then how the decisions would be taken to reopen areas. So you're right, if it's, a, if it's a ward area that has predominantly single rooms, it may be possible to say, for example, I don't know, isolate, deep clean a very specific area so that actually the impact is as minimal as possible on the service that's been provided. Whereas in a completely different context, if it's a Florence Nightingale type ward with longer term admissions of the issues around staffing levels, it may be a longer period of time before things can be put in place so that we have that assurance that, that the situation is safe enough again to open patients. So it's really context specific. I was really just looking for a degree of clarification because, you know, uh, especially with some of the new hospitals, that the the single rooms could be isolated uh, and you weren't actually going to close a ward, as, uh, per se. Um, but in some of the circumstances, even the Nightingale, where there's a mixed Nightingale and single rooms, the potential to move people from the Nightingale into a single room, so therefore you're isolating the patient too. And it was just that degree of flexibility I wanted to tease out from you. And I, I acknowledge that it is last resort. Thanks, Dennis. Um, I've got Richard. Yes, thank you, uh, uh, convener. Uh, again, it's not on the same vein, but slightly. Uh, there have been, we've mentioned about staffing levels, we've mentioned about concerns about how to close a ward, but I noticed from the submission from the Royal College of Nursing Scotland that they also say closing a ward may be necessary because of systematic failing and a service may also be the result of a health board trying to meet the Scottish Government set heat standard that applies to one service and has an unintended consequence on another part. The RCN would not want to see a situation where individual staff members working in wards are penalised because of a systematic failing from an unintended consequence of a health board's effort to meet a, a heat standard. Can I have your views on that, Comic? Um well, um, I don't think that uh, would, would ever happen, that any particular uh, member of staff uh, would be penalised. That's not the intention. And um, as we've said, this, this collective uh, responsibility, um, and I think perhaps that's um, a rather sort of negative view from um, the, the Royal College in that it's not about penalising anybody uh, in particular. In terms of meeting heat targets, I mean, it really is not about that. It's about making sure that the well-being and safety of all involved, whether it be staff or the patients or the public, is paramount. Thank you. I, I just wanted that comment on the record. Thanks. Uh, Bob Doris. Uh, thank you very much, convener. Um, just at the start, I mean, this is obviously following the recommendation from the leaving inquiry. I just kind of Let's start. I want to put on record that uh, my family have had recourse to use the veil of leaving in, in recent months in relation to palliative care for my mother and the outstanding um, service, and how they did very well by my mother and my family. I want to put that on the record, given the fact that that's the context in which we look at these the, these recommendations. Uh, moving on from that, I also feel as if the witnesses in front of us have got a little bit of a of a short straw because you've been you've been urged to think about cataclysmic scenarios where. HIS would have to use these last resort powers, and then when you can't quite come up with them, then there, there's issues around that. So I can I get it. I suppose the point I would make is we didn't foresee what happened at the Vale, so you never know when you might need these powers, and I kind of get that. So given the fact that we might not always know when we need to use them, because you never know what tomorrow will bring or what is unforeseen, which is the point of having these powers, I suppose speed would be the theme that I would like to explore. So I'm not asking for a scenario. I suppose what I'm asking for is a, the speed of any chain of events or process by which it's brought to the attention of his 
via whatever mechanism that there could be significant issues and uh, you know escalation process within his and within the the health board could take <laughs> quite a bit of time and could be bureaucratic i suppose i would want a reassurance that it wouldn't be um if there were real significant issues so the speed of the process i suppose is the theme that i would like to explore Okay, can I thank Bob Doris for his uh, comments about the uh, veil of leaving? And of course, Lord McLean's report made 75 recommendations, 65 for the NHS, nine for the Scottish Government, and one for the Crown Office, all of which were accepted uh, and, if not implemented, are being implemented. Um, but I think it goes back to my, um, Mr. McKenzie's uh, question about the. Uh, algorithm and the algorithm really is a framework which provides a brief description of the roles and responsibilities um, for each national group and people within that and I think by having that then we can speed up the process uh, as uh, Bob Doris suggests but I don't know if anyone else wants to come in on that. If I may convener just to, to say that um, speed is of the essence in, in, the, in this situation that um, our current escalation um, process is extremely fast. I'm a mere phone call away from Jackie and or the senior inspector team and decisions are made on the ground in real time um, in order to ensure that patient care is not compromised. Um, this escalation algorithm cannot be a bureaucratic process. It must have the same degree of speed and if it's a continuation of the existing algorithm, then we need to make sure that that um, decision making is done as swiftly as possible. I'm glad we got within that process, uh, within that, that answer. I don't want to explore the algorithms. I'll leave that to, to Mike McKenzie. Is, is the human touch aspect of it in, in terms of pick up the phone, speak to the most senior person at the health board, who is the chief executive, clear your diary, let's have that meeting. We have to chat. We have enforcement powers if they have to be used. I suppose that's what I was looking to hear. And somewhere within those answers, I kind of got that, but I got the algorithm as well. Uh, so we'll not explore the algorithm any further. Um, I, I suppose I'm reassured by that. We will pick up the phone and we will chat and we will chat immediately is kind of what I was hoping to hear. Um, you never know when things... Look, we've got a wonderful NHS, but you never know when things will go wrong. It's such a vast organisation. So there's always a situation where... Where the health boards, without the enforcement powers, may decide to close a ward to new admissions, for example, because of uh, unforeseen events. I would like to think that there is contingency planning takes place within NHS boards anyway. So I've explored speed. And I've had some reassurances in, in relation to that. I suppose you never know where the need to use this power may manifest itself. And I would like to think that health boards already have contingency planning in place for what would they do if... I mean, it could be a fire alarm going off, it could be a health and safety uh, aspect, it could be a fabric of the building aspect, it doesn't have to be a, a clinical incident where wards may not be able to be used. So do HIS have a role in relation to making boards have effective contingency planning? Do they have contingency planning anyway? And what would the mechanisms be around that? We don't have a direct role in terms of contingency planning for health boards. Health boards clearly have a role in ensuring they have robust disaster recovery, contingency planning arrangements in place, and chief executives are the accountable officer are there to test those plans to ensure they're robust and ensure they're effective. What we can be doing, though, is when we um, carry out inspections, is to understand how those plans are understood by staff and how they would be deployed in certain situations. So um, examples in the, the healthcare environment inspections, so we look at their plans in for certain instances and also in um, older people's inspections, we look at what their arrangements would be in terms of staffing levels. So whilst boards have responsibility and accountability for that, we do take an interest in the robustness and effectiveness of those plans. Jackie? Yeah, and that's right. And so if there were issues, for example, around fire regulations, for example, then we would be testing with staff their knowledge about, for example, how they would evacuate a building in the event of. So the, these things do come up periodically across our inspection programmes. I suppose my, my final question in relation to that would be, and, and accept the contingency planning would, would be for the health board, but if there were and let's hope you don't have to ever have these conversations, immediate, speedy conversations with a health board chief executive saying, if this doesn't get sorted, we will instruct you to dot, 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 eventually close the ward to new admissions or whatever. Uh, at that point, would you expect to say, 
We don't want this to happen, but we might do it in the next few days. What are your contingencies? Would you be asking that question at that point? Uh, absolutely, and I think that's an important point, is that um, we expect boards as of now, to be responding to concerns we may identify in inspections, even without those powers. And I have to say, in my experience, that boards respond very quickly and very swiftly, and we have follow-up mechanisms to ensure that the arrangements are effective and in place. Just for clarity, and it's probably the lack of brevity in my question is the reason I'm not clear the answer, and, and that is, if you have... I know, Mr Robertson, I'm not known, renowned for it. Um, I hope the process of escalating affairs is quicker than my questions. Um, so, if you have that conversation, the first time you have that conversation with the health board saying we might use these powers, at that point do you say we must see your contingency plans? Yeah, uh, uh, absolutely, and that's that's the point of the of the powers that are in reserve, and in the knowledge that the boards know that we have those powers, then I think that's the nature of how boards then respond. Okay, thank you. A much more difficult area, though, and a practical then what we're puzzling about. We know, you know, if, 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 you know, if the place is going on fire or a disease, I mean, they're, they're fairly obvious. You smell the smoke, the, the, the bells ringing, there are people being sick, whatever. But in the controversial area, which has been mentioned this morning, I suppose it's been controversial uh, uh, you know, in some of our discussions, is the whole question of staff mix and staff levels. Now, how, you know, where, where is the, the, the role for and how, how do you escalate that quickly? Because you're, you're not there in two or three shifts when, 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 when the staffing levels are dipped because of sickness or pressure or whatever. Uh, you're, you're not there when there's only one senior nurse on a, you know, looking, looking at a you know, ward full of 20-odd people or whatever. You know, so so how, 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 do, how do you intervene reasonably in that situation and say, and wag the big finger and say, if you don't get that sorted out, then you're potentially at risk of closing down that facility because you're not staffing it properly, because the staff mix is not right. So in, in areas like that, because your relationship up to now with the health boards, Mr Pearson, has been to seek improvement, not conflict in the position of rules from outside, but to give people time and they get a lots of time to deal with some of the issues that you've identified in your inspections. They get weeks and months. Sometimes you trust them to, to, to tell you that they've dealt with that. and You don't go back and inspect again for some time or whatever. You know, so how do you deal with an issue as complex as staff mixing and staff levels? Um, can you, there's a number of levels to, to this. Uh, I think, firstly, we do take an interest in, in staffing levels, and increasingly so, for instance, in our older people's inspections, and we ask to see the staffing rotas, um, not just on the day of the inspection, but in the previous weeks and what's projected over the next period of time. So that's an increasing area of interest to us. Um, and as regards the, the timetable for response, we do have um, fairly swift um, escalation of concerns within our existing algorithm, but we also set in place, for instance, in our healthcare environment inspections, um, requirements, and we set timetable around the response of NHS boards to respond to those requirements based on the concerns, and, and um, it, it can be an expectation when we're back next week or the following day, we expect this to be in place. So there is a swifter turnaround. On a broader issue, um, convener, if I may, is... Um, we consulted last year and we were taking forward work under the quality of care reviews to look at more comprehensive assessments of health care and the things that impact on health care. Workforce and leadership is a fundamental component of that. And obviously we've had bigger and broader reviews in that respect, such as in NHS Grampian at Aberdeen Royal Infirmary. And the intention is we will be using that much more um, systematic and comprehensive assessment of workforce effectiveness and leadership in the future and that will then get into these more complex issues and computer this, and, this, and this this would help you to make progress in that area of establishing uh, it's, it's, it's an important power to have us yep. to have for us yep. but i think the broader question is about how we take forward that um deeper consideration of the factors that impact on the quality of care we know that the care inspect and residential facilities you know focus on Sometimes staff changes can cause failure and whatever, whatever. And I'll, but um, I will return to some some of that that that, that later. And some of our recommendations are uh, coming out of uh, you know about 
about working together and learning from each other on some of these issues. I've got Malcolm Chisholm. I have got the power at present to direct health boards to close wards, but in terms of the other steps in the escalation pro uh, process, have you got the power in relation to each of those steps to direct boards? So those steps at the moment are about cooperation um, with NHS boards between Healthcare Improvement Scotland and ultimately the chief executive of that board. So those are sufficient at present. Um, the, the, the final point in terms of that power to close a ward is obviously informed by that cooperative relationship in terms of escalation all the way up to that use of that ultimate power. There isn't a series of subsidiary powers underlying that, but um, in terms of the uh, legal director might be able to confirm that I'm using the language right here. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd agree with that. Yeah, well, I, I suppose some people might say, why, why, why are you not being given a wider power? Um, obviously, some people say you shouldn't be given this power, but you could argue that if it's a step process, why are you only given the power for the ultimate sanction rather than to have a direct a directive power uh, over the other areas as well? Well, well I, I feel, if I may convene, I, I feel that the, the, the powers that we have in this ultimate sanction are sufficient without a whole series of other separate um, powers which might at the end up with a, a, a more bureaucratic debate and discussion at each of those steps. I think the key point is about the speed of this um, response at moments of um, concern and I think that's a, the, the critical thing rather than necessary the, a series of subsidiary pieces of legislation or powers underlying the overall sanction. I mean during the four years you've been director of scrutiny without giving without naming the place as it were can you think of occasions when you would have found this power to be useful? In, in on, honesty I, I believe that um, boards have responded without this power However, I think it's an important power to still have in the context of where there may be serious and significant service failings and to have that power there now, I think, is an important step. We have carried out 535 reviews and inspections since the establishment of Healthcare Improvement Scotland um, and um, we formally escalated to Scottish Government matters of concern on five occasions. So that reflects a number of things. I think the, the main thing, though, is about the quality of care, but it's also about the fact that when we have escalated, whether informally at the local level or more formally to the chief executive, the boards have responded. And finally, I don't know if this is for you or the minister, given that the cabinet secretary already has the power to direct health boards, I mean, why do you think you need it specifically rather than just going to the cabinet secretary and saying this requires to be done? <laughs> um, well, I, th I, think, um, I think the important point here is um, a, f a few things is about the overall shape of accountability in Scotland. Um, it's quite a shallow hierarchy um, uh, within the health service in Scotland and there's a very short escalation between a, a chair of a health board to ministers and to the cabinet secretary. So the context for Scotland is important to think about. Um, and I, I think the, the, the second point I'd make is that um, these powers also sit in a broader context of powers for ministers in the ladder of escalation and the powers that ministers can have to intervene in a health board um, more generally. And the, and the cabinet secretary would be involved at all stages. I mean, the information flow is, is very quick in terms of things like this. That raised some of the questions, you know, jumping on to Malcolm's problems raised by the RCN about political interference and and whether the independence, you know, if you, f if you feel that uh, you've got to escalate this, it's the wrong time of the year, it's the wrong time of the political cycle, it's uh, uh, proposing a closure of a, a high-profile facility um, six weeks away from an election, and ultimately, the, you know, the, 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 the Cabinet Secretary, whoever he or she may be, can and say, you know, I don't, I don't want that bad news at this particular time. Convener, patient safety is paramount. I mean, Elizabeth, I... Yeah, I mean, that's, um, I'd say patient safety is the important paramount uh, thing here. And these powers are intended as a, a backstop um, to be used when um, all, all health has failed and actually giving the power to his to um, direct to um, order the clerk to ask the um, 
to ask the board to close the ward actually removes ministers from that direct decision. Of course, ministers will be kept informed because um, it's of, of int wider interest to their, um, to their responsibilities, but the responsibility rests with his, and it would be for his to take that decision in partnership with the health decision board. Decision and forum, rather than discuss mm -hmm. with the Cabinet Secretary where you take that decision or not. So you would take a decision at his, that in your view and all the information you've received, that that facility would have to close because consistently there's been low staffing levels and a poor mix, etc. So you would take that decision that that would have to close and you would inform the Cabinet Secretary of your decision rather than have a discussion with the Cabinet Secretary before you made that decision. That is correct, Convener. An important right. point is about the powers that are vested in Health Care Improvement in Scotland to make these decisions. Hmm. Malcolm. I, mean, I was just exploring different uh, aspects of it, and I mean, I actually think it's a very good power to have, so just in case anybody misunderstands me. No one. I think we're going to respond to Malcolm there. No, I'm just make, making a comment. Yeah, we're making a comment that time. Um, I've got the net. It's just that. Um, the RCN have suggested that this new power could potentially give you a conflict of interest, given that you've sort of dual role of, of scrutiny and improvement. Do you agree with that comment, or would you like to say anything about that? I don't agree with that comment. I think the important thing is how we utilise a mix and blend of expertise and skills and capability within Healthcare Improvement Scotland. Um, in, indeed, the King's Fund published a paper just recently about improving quality in England and it's very much encouragement for England to study what's happening, improving quality in Scotland and the work of Healthcare Improvement Scotland in the mix of things we have within our organisations such as the Scottish Health Council, our evidence-based scrutiny and improvement. What we do need to do is to make sure that when we scrutinise we're seen to be independent, we act independently and provide um, recommendations without fear or favour. Um, but I think the bigger opportunity for us as an organisation is how we use the range of things within our organisation to make us more efficient, more effective than we, if we were having to transact with a range of bodies. Thank you for that. Okay. Richard Lyle. Can I ask, um, and to basically tie this up, you're going to get an extra power, uh, which you may or may not use. Do you have sufficient staffing levels in order to cope with this? I think the staffing levels um, are not directly related to the power. Um, I believe increasingly as an organisation we've got um, an excellent group of inspectors within the team who come with a, a clinical background, for instance, in our older people's inspections. What will be increasingly important on the point of workforce is that we'll never have all the skills and expertise within Healthcare Improvement Scotland and we'll be increasingly reliant on skills and expertise and professionals to come and join us and work with us whether it's in any part of our organisation or whether it's in an inspections, and that will be increasingly in demand on health boards to provide clinical experts, for instance, to carry out inspections. Thank you. Any other questions? I just want to touch on the, the context that the, the, the Health Improvement Scotland and Care Inspector operate and, um, and uh, refer back to a report uh, and inquiry and the regulation of uh, care for older people. Um, and that was in, I think we reported in 2012. And at that time, there was a big focus and agreement that we would uh, have a set of national care standards in place that all of, all of you would work to, which included things, you know, recommendations that report, uh, staffing levels, staff mix, etc. Not, you know, particularly in the uh, in that inquiry in and uh, the 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 residential settings and in, in, the, in the community. When, 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 when uh, do, are we all working on the development of national care standards in the context that the, 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 the regulatory people work under? Do we now recognise that there are very similar arrangements as a result of the integration of health and social care? That for people that's a pathway and a journey and um, how much are we learning from one another all of the agencies who, 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 who work in this field and are we closely working together to develop um, a, a, you know the good practice across those agencies of not bringing them all together minister I think the short answer is yes but uh, um, I'll leave it to right. uh, okay. to uh, 
Mr. To give you the uh, fuller Thank version. you. Thanks, Minister. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you, Convener uh, and Minister. The, um, what we're doing in, in several levels, firstly in the National Care Standards, there's been um, an excellent consultation on the National Care Standards and the set of principles, very much human rights based, has been agreed. We now have detailed work working with ourselves jointly with the Care Inspectorate to now take forward more detailed National Care Standards, which will be fundamental in supporting more integrated health and social care in uh, communities and care settings. So that's the first thing to say that's happening. Um, no. Is there any of that information you can make public to? We're looking at um, our, our legacy paper, um, and it was an important recommendation you know, way back. I mean, the National Care Standards are now how old when were the last reviewed? Um, I think it will be years? about 2002. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, work is now underway in taking forward those new. How much information can be shared by the committee at this stage? Uh, uh, absolutely. So in terms of the work around the National Care Standards, very happy to, to share that with the committee and the principles that have been agreed, and we'll, we'll share that. Yeah, thank um, you. The, the next thing to say is um, one of the key things from the, um, the review that the committee did was about the joint working more generally with the Care Inspectorate, and um, we have been doing joint inspections with the Care Inspectorate for the care of older adults. Uh, we've done quite a number of in inspections now, probably around eight or nine inspections um, across Scotland, and it's been really informative in uh, looking at the different models of care and sharing good practice, your point, convener. Uh, we're now undertaking a review of that methodology, ensuring that it's fit for purpose in the context of the health and social care partnerships, and that work's been led by two non-executives from within Health Care Improvement Scotland and the Care Inspectorate, John Glenny and David Wiseman. So it's a piece of work jointly we're taking forward and again just emphasises the importance of the Care Inspectorate and Health Care Improvement Scotland going with the grain in respect of service delivery in the individuals' communities. That's good to hear and we look forward to the additional information that can be provided to the committee. Uh, uh, is there any other questions from committee members? If there's not, can I express the committee's uh, gratitude and appreciation for the minister, our colleagues that have been here for a, quite a while this morning, and, um, uh, and uh, our colleagues from Health Inspection Service, uh, Improvement Service. Thank you very much to you all. Thank you. Suspend at this point.